challenging somebody, making them uncomfortable, disquieting them, uh, you know. And uh, if I, uh, as an instructor, restrain myself from ever coming back when someone asks what I think is a silly question by letting it be known that I thought the question was silly, respectfully, but nevertheless, uh, am I giving something important up as a tool of instruction? Everybody who is tuned in, you're at The Glenn Show. This is Glenn Lowry. Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute in New York City. I'm a professor at Brown University. I'm with John McWhorter, who is a professor at Columbia University and writes for the New York Times on a regular basis. John and I talk every other week at The Glenn Show. So welcome, John. Welcome back. Thank you, Glenn. Good to be here. So, yeah, man, you're the man. You're the man because you've got a platform and uh, you're pronouncing on a regular basis on all manner of things, including things having to do with race. Mm-hmm. Most recently, um, it is most recently, isn't it? The uh, uh, the the volleyball case. The column about the volleyball Duke volleyball player right. Rachel Richardson. Do I get her mm-hmm. name correct? That's right. Yeah, uh, who alleged that uh, she was verbally assaulted by fans at a uh, match uh, that uh, the Duke uh, volleyball team, women's volleyball team, was playing in um, Salt Lake City with against Brigham Young team. Racist uh, statements made from the audience and so forth. And there is a controversy because, uh, well, you can explain it better than I. It appears that there's no evidence or no one's been able to find any evidence that the a barrage of slurs that she alleges to have happened actually took place. And you reflect in your column, which I'd like to discuss with you now, on this general problem or issue of, quote, hoaxes, close quote, Mm -hmm. in which people allege racial injury, which turns out not to be quite as they uh, have described it, and uh, what you make of that general phenomenon. Do I introduce that properly? Correct me if I do not. you did, and it's um, it's a sensitive issue because you don't want to dump on somebody who's very young, and frankly, I think might be troubled. Um, that's just, it's just a guess, but the claim is that there was this ongoing barrage of abuse, and even her father talked about there's this raucous, you know, outcry, and you're imagining this barbaric situation, but. The thing is, we live in an era where something like that is lovingly recorded from, you know, basically many angles, many sources, and none of the sources show it, and nobody has come forward to corroborate this. And the important thing is, there's a certain kind of person who would say nobody's come forward because everybody's a racist and they don't want to admit it. But the thing is, for every person who was like that, if any of them actually exist, there'd be somebody else who's not a racist and wants to back up this person. People would have come forward and said, yes, I heard it. Okay, it doesn't seem to be on the tapes because the recording is from too far away, but I was there. There would be some ally who did that as you know, part of their sense of service, especially today after 2020. Nobody's come forward. And if they had come forward, we'd have heard about it in the news. There'd be no reason to keep it quiet. And so you end up thinking, and I didn't want to think this at first, but I must admit it's gotten to the point that I suppose that this is probably true, that... She's at least vastly exaggerating. Maybe she heard one person say some one thing sotto voce. But she might not have heard anything. And the clear truth is that the story that she's telling isn't true. I mean, it, it's some, some, if anything happened, it was quite different from that. And so you're wondering, well, why would she claim this? You know, is she trying to cover something up? Does she just like drama? Why would someone do it? And it seems to me to be part of a theme. It's not just dogpiling on poor Rachel Richardson. It's that in our era, and I'm wondering if this is true for you too, whenever you hear a story about racism that's that colorful, when it's about somebody in you know, the clear blue of day you know, yelling you know, the invective at somebody like that, knowing that you know, cameras and phones are all over the place, when you hear about the most egregious things, it starts with Tawana Brawley in a way, when it's that colorful, it's almost never true. It's at the point where whenever I hear a story like that, my first thought is, how long is it going to be before we learn that that's a hoax and the news covers it up? Covers it up. 
And I would say that is the case. Nine out of 10 times, probably more. It's not that there's no racism. It's that these stories out of Roots and out of 1940 never pan out. And it's gotten to the point that I feel that I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't hear stories like that with a certain skepticism. So I heard about people, you know, yelling nigger, nigger, nigger at this poor girl, you know, at BYU while she's trying to play volleyball. And I thought, really? In 2022, somebody did that? And we're talking about lots of people and it just builds and builds and builds like something out of some historical movie. I thought, no, I can't believe that happened. And I didn't say anything. I waited a month, but it didn't. Have you noticed that those stories, that type of story, is almost never true? Also with nooses. You have to be careful with these noose accounts. They're never true. What kind of blowback have you gotten on this? I mean, I, <laughs> the reason I hesitate, <laughs> never is a strong word, but I hear you. The reason I hesitate is that uh, I can imagine the blowback. I mean, uh, you're telling me with the bodies uh, littering um, all the streets of America of dead black people killed by racists, et cetera, that what you choose to focus on with your enormous megaphone is uh, the rare instance in which there's something dubious about a claim that somebody might make. And you admit yourself that we don't really know fully. I mean, we're, we have to make a surmise. You know, it must not have probably didn't happen. Or otherwise, we would have then. That's all a surmise. We don't, we don't know that she's lying. Uh, we just have every reason to suspect that she's exaggerating, but we don't know. Why do you choose to use your megaphone to poo-poo and downplay uh, these these uh, allegations when there is so much uh, uh, there's so much uh, evident racism? I mean, uh, you get that blowback. I mean, I, I'm I'm not sticking my neck out there, John. I'm letting you twist in the wind a little bit. On no. This. That's, you know, I'm sure I haven't really checked, but I'm sure that's the sort of thing certain types are saying on social media. But the thing is, a story like hers is important, not just as some anecdote, but because it shows that there is progress. You know, we are at a point where you can find incidents of racism, such as Los Angeles, those council people. I was about to are, mention that. You know, these Latino council people who are having these yeah. conversations, you know, that are, you know, naked, racist, jocular nasty comments that I'm sure they wish they had remembered could have been recorded. They didn't want anybody to hear it. But the thing is, that's ordinary. It's sad, but it's ordinary. That is the way real people talk behind closed doors. And, you know, we can work on that. But that's racism. But it's not colorful. It's not bizarre. It's not unusual. We can be quite sure that council people, black council people, white council people are talking that way all over the country. What's unusual is these cartoon cases. And frankly, it's not the 40s. It's not Jackie Robinson <laughs> being shouted down and, you know, having to wisp listen to things whispered and said at him while he's trying to play. Luckily, we've gotten past that. Whereas the people who pull these hoaxes want you to think that we haven't gotten anywhere past that era. And I think that we need to stand tall and say, no, you have to allow progress even if we're not there yet. Now, what about all these basketball players? I can't cite chapter and verse because I just don't remember, but I've heard over and over again people complaining, basketball players complaining. In fact, there has even been an altercation. Somebody almost ran into the stands after a fan who yelled something. But again, I can't remember exactly what the details of it were. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 you, do you completely discount the idea that... Uh, with blacks so prominently overrepresented in uh, competitive athletics and with uh, let's go Brandon kind of uh, attitudes out there in certain, uh, you know, segments of the sports audience and whatnot, uh, that uh, they, beneath the surface, racism might not manifest itself sometimes. And um, the, again, do, do you want to be spending your time uh, as your colleague Charles Blow does making those cases when it does happen prominent, or do you want to be spending your time as the seemingly conservative John McWhorter does, poo-pooing the relatively few times when there's some reason to doubt whether or not it's true? Um, so I repeat myself. Yeah, I think um, you have to 
pull the camera further back than a lot of those people. So isn't it a classic trope of sports? Let's take it back to 1930. Everybody's white. It's all in black and white. There are people in the stands. If you watch an old movie, if you read an old comic strip, if you were perhaps there, it doesn't have to be 1930. Isn't it that the white baseball players are running around and there are these guys in the stands with fedoras and cigars saying, <laughs> Ah, so's your old man. Ah, go back to where you came from, <laughs> you SOB. Isn't that what sports was like? So today, yeah. well, you know, in many sports, all the guys down there are black, or many of them. Is the idea that you can't yell at them because they're black? No. If what they're yelling is N-word, 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 that's yeah. one thing. And I'm going to put myself on the line. I don't know sports. So I don't know if there's this long series of anecdotes about people being called the N-word from the stands. But if what it is, is you can't play. Go back to where you came from. And maybe people are thinking, what do you mean, Africa? But the thing is, people used to yell that at Ty Cobb. So, you know, how sensitive are we expecting everybody to be? In a way, you're not really part of the club unless you're being yelled at. If The minute you yell at a black football player, you're a racist. What about the fact that sports players get yelled at all the time. And for that to not even come up is the problem. Maybe there's an answer to that, but for it to not even come up and for people to just say racism is, you know, rearing its ugly head. I don't know. No, I it think, just strikes me I as think you're making a good point. point. Yeah. Uh, I, I see what you're saying. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a baseball game or a hockey match after all. God darn it. People are drinking beer. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit rough around the edges. They're partisans and they're yelling out at their team. <laughs> I can remember my late wife, uh, Linda, uh, and I ventured into Boston Garden to see the uh, Black, the uh, uh, Bruins, the Boston Bruins play. So the one and only time I've actually seen live um, a hockey match. Hockey is not my sport. I go to the Garden all the time to watch the Celtics, but very seldom to see uh, uh, to see the Bruins. So we're there, and they're playing the St. Louis Blues. Hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Everybody around us is drunk and raucous and yelling at the top of their voice, St. Louis sucks! St. Louis sucks! They're yep. yelling it, you know, at the top of their voice. And if there had been an ethnic characterization to the St. Louis team, let's say that most of them had been ethnic Irish, ethnic or, uh, or if Italian it was Oakland or, or something, yeah. Or, or, or whatever, that certainly would have crept in to the rough and tumble of the, of the uh, denunciation of these St. Louis you know, whatever, uh, by the partisans who were in the, in the audience. So <laughs> that, uh, in 21st century America, that kind of feeling might sometimes express itself through a racially, you know, uh, uh, it, it awkward expression shouldn't surprise us. And are we going to be, that is, we Black Americans who are living in the 21st century, not in the 20th century, tough enough to accept that that kind of behavior may simply be a way of saying, welcome to the club, you know? You, yeah. You, here this we are. idea that I'm black, you can't insult me. And that's supposed to be some kind of strength. If you insult me, I'm going to scream and make your life miserable. No, that puts you in the down position. It makes you look delicate. Of course, you know, if you're, you're black and you're participating, you're in there dealing like everybody else, then you're going to get knocked. Now, the sensitive issue is, to what extent is it allowed to be racialized at all? And the, th and the fact is, is it going to be not racialized ever at all? Well, if you decree that, you're just waiting to get your feelings hurt. Because yes, people differentiate between one another based on group membership aspects of things. The Irish, the Italians, some little things might, you know, pop up in terms of, you know, how people are made fun of. But where do you draw that line? That's, that's sensitive. But this business that if you are black, you are exempt from ridicule except by people of your own skin color? No, because you're just asking to have a reason to be very deeply offended by something that will inevitably happen, which frankly, if you're a psychologically healthy person, shouldn't hurt you all that much. It's a pose. It's, it's, we're encouraged to do a kind of play acting. And it's just, it, it won't work. I wonder, I, don't, I know nothing about volleyball, but was it maybe that somebody was basically addressing her as somebody from the other team and said some so's your old man sort of thing. We don't know. 
And she took it as, well, this person is abusing me as a black person because I'm black and I'm not supposed to be insulted. Whereas the person may have said it about one of the white girls from the Duke team too, and then that's okay. Is it that, is it that Rachel Richardson is exempt because she's black? I don't get it. I don't see what the point is of making that stipulation when it's never going to be observed. We're on dangerous ground here, but I think it could be fertile. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind now, what would it mean to genuinely be a member of the team? Okay, mm-hmm. that is, it's, a, it's an inter-ethnic working group. We're late at night. We've had a couple of drinks. Uh, we're all under pressure and stress because it's a hard project that we're working on and the stakes are high. And people are making jokes. They're making jokes about sexuality. They're, they're, they're making jokes about religion. You know, the Jewish guy on the team, it's the butt of a friendly jest. Uh, you know, it, it, it's nothing, you know, nothing, you know, the Irish guy, people are drinking and, you know, there's a, there's a little joke that's made about the thing. Is being willing to take the risk of venturing into that territory in jest a sign of respect and true equality of membership? And is forbearing from the, the give and take, the back and forth, the, the kind of jousting of, uh, you know, genuine interpersonal interaction, forbearing from it for fear of giving offense, treating with the kid glove, is, is, is that a kind of inequality, a kind of, you know, I, I don't trust enough the nature of our relationship to be willing to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I'm acting now with you. I'm, I'm not letting my hair down with you a little bit. And it, it seems like it's a hard one for me because, you know, the, the um, sentiment of the time, the diversity, equity, inclusion sentiment of the time, the, the equity training, you know, the diversity training that goes on inside of organizations is, I assume, going to push people away from that kind of thing. And it's going to be a form where uh, the the black member of the team can you know voice their injury, their sense of injury, and where the facilitator is not going to welcome uh, the 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 jousting that might give offense, but is going to try to train it out of the the rest of the team. And yeah, uh, and the problem is that if the tacit rule, and it's always the tacit ones that are the hardest. If the tacit, whoops, I want my mic. If the tacit rule is you may you have to respect me and so you can't you can't twit me and so the whites feel like we can't let our hair down around that person well next that means that the whites are never going to have a genuinely warm feeling towards that person they're going to be a little less inclined to invite that person out for drinks there's going to be perceived by the black person a certain scrim curtain and then you know where that goes they won't let me in there's a difference i found out they had drinks without me there's a guardedness Etc. But of course, who started it? That's the problem. If you can't be made fun of at all, you're not part of the group. Just like among black men, the N word serves that purpose. You know, if you can't be called that among many black men, then you're not one of them. Well, that's human as well. And so you start thinking about the black person who doesn't make partner at the law firm. And I've heard stories about this where the reason was that. Once you get beyond brute qualifications, it becomes who you like, who, you, who you, you, you hung out with, who you get the feeling makes a connection with clients. If the way you feel with anybody who isn't your own color is that you're always waiting for them to say something that could be interpreted as disrespecting you because you feel like that's what makes you matter, all that's well and good, but it means that the clients aren't going to like you as much as they're going to like the person where they felt like they could relax more. People joke. And so, yeah, it's a hard one. I can see where people are coming from in thinking you can't make a joke around me about anything having to do, especially having to do with blackness or even just in general, don't josh me because then you're putting me lower and that reminds me of 1920. But the problem is you weren't alive in 1920 or even 1960 these days probably. And what, what, what point does it serve? Because next thing you know, you're saying that what you feel is racism all around you. You can't quite put your finger on it. But what it is, is that you've made it so that nobody can feel comfortable around you. And so it ends up being this feedback loop. And that needs to be talked about more. And I don't think we're going to hear it from the DEI people. But that's a, that's a lapse in their argumentation. You know, I'm thinking about what 
boot camp might have been like in the army mm. 50 years ago. The drill sergeant, <clears throat> you, you know, you're trying to build this, uh, you're trying to build this uh, spirit of mm -hmm. uh, mutuality and sacrifice. And, uh, you know, the guy's yelling in your face and he's cursing you and he's calling you all kinds of things. And he's using every uh, device that he can think of to get to you. He wants to, to break you down. He wants to make you cry. You know, he, want, he, want, he wants to really, and, and he's trying to toughen you up and he's trying to, whatever he's trying to do. Uh, and maybe the time has passed for that kind of thing. Maybe in, if there are women and men in the boot camp uh, platoon, the drill sergeant can't use the gender thing against the women. Oh, you know, you, you think you're tough enough to fight? You know, you're just a woman kind of thing like that to try to goad them because that would be over the line. Um, and maybe the end game of this kind of thing is they're all willing to fight and die for each other because they've been through hell together. But the way it starts is by pricking right at that sore spot and bringing it all out into the open and, uh, you know, whatever. I'm thinking off the top of my head, but I'm, you know, the strategic use of the insult, you know, kind of thing like that. I mean, an, an analogy would be in comedy where the comedian stands up and presses right on that sore spot by going right up to the edge and maybe just a little bit beyond. And we're laughing, you know, and, and he wants to make us or she laugh by uh, the blatant violation of our, you know, niceties and our formal constraints and whatnot by going where no person dare go. But uh, in going there, exposing something that's, you know, and ambiguous and, and nuanced and, uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, uh, we deprive ourselves of all of that and we live in a kind of sanitized world if we have these restrictions and rules that um, are uh, designed never, never to give offense. I'm thinking about the classroom. No, I'm not insulting students, of course not. Not engaging in racist language in the classroom, not using the N-word in the classroom, but Challenging somebody, making them uncomfortable, disquieting them, uh, you know. And uh, if I, uh, as an instructor, restrain myself from ever coming back when someone asks what I think is a silly question by letting it be known that I thought the question was silly, respectfully, but nevertheless, uh, am I giving something important up as a tool of instruction. Uh, they don't like the Socratic method in law school anymore, I'm told. You know, the blind calling on people uh, and making them recite the facts of the case and answer your question about the law because it puts people on the spot and, you know, it exposes their perhaps weak preparation, whatever. And, and yet that was a, for many, many years, a powerful instrument of uh, pedagogic uh, process. And so, yeah, anyway. it's... um. You remember things randomly, and I often talk about how what turned me as a black thinker was the L.A. riots at the beginning of the 90s. But I look back on something else, which really was the first time I realized there was something wrong with me. And I don't know if I've talked about it on the show before, but we've done so many that you know, chances are that if I talked about it before, if most people haven't heard it. I was on a debate team for about 10 minutes when I was in, I think, ninth and 10th grade. And one of the things that they did to give us a sense of how to really compete is they brought in this local Philadelphia champion debater. And um, he was, you know, he was formidable. And he just came in to show us how it was done. And so literally we were standing in the middle of a room and he was standing next to me, and then he did the thing like in an old movie. He walked behind me, circled me, walking behind my shoulders, and we were doing, <laughs> we were debating some point, like whether something about smoking, I seem to remember, and cigarette companies. And I thought I had it down, and he just tore me up. He didn't yell, but it's just he knew how to debate, and he pushed me back into a corner and made me feel foolish. And mm. I didn't like it. And he wasn't especially obnoxious, just rather. In other words, he was a champion debater, old school. <laughs> I had never had anyone do that to me before. And, you know, and it was, it was very unpleasant. Like he, he had very bad breath, I remember. So it was even worse, <laughs> a sensory issue. 
And, you know, after that was over, I remember, literally, I feel like I was in a corner. I probably was not physically in a corner. But I thought, deep down, there's a part of me that feels like he's a racist. And, you know, I'm black enough that I felt, couldn't he have been nicer to a black boy? But then another part of me thought, no, this is what champion debating is. I happen to be black here. But if he hadn't done that to me, I wouldn't know what I was going to be up against when we go downtown and do this for real. And what he did hurt my feelings, but frankly, it was also somewhat awesome. And I want to be able to do that. And I kind of carried it with me, that notion of tight debate. I carry it with me today. And I remember thinking at the time, at the time I thought, there's something wrong with me because I know that most of the other black kids at this school, and this was a private Quaker school, most of the other black kids at this school of my age would think that this guy is a racist. They would feel abused in some way. And I thought, I don't feel that way, and I know I'm right. And I just, you know, then I walked away from it, didn't think about it for many years. But I wish more of us thought in that way. If you can't be belittled at all, if you can't be given the real goods, if you can't be asked the Socratic question, you're not part of the club. And to think, well, I don't want to be part of the club because my ancestors were slaves and there was redlining, and the police don't like black people. No. No, I don't see how that follows. What you do is you cope with what's put in front of you. You protest, of course, but you don't accept the down position permanently and sign yourself off from serious effort out of a sense that that's the way you salute your ancestors and George Floyd. No, I don't think even George Floyd would think of that as a salute if you put it to him. The problem, it's a real problem. What did you make of that LA uh, City Council? This was a meeting at the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, where amongst uh, Latino politicians in L.A., um, Ron Herrera, who was president of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, Nuri Marie Martinez, Martinez, who's uh, president of the L.A. City Council, a number of other elected officials in Los Angeles County, discussing the um, redistricting, uh, upcoming redistricting uh, dynamic of city council district lines being drawn and lapsing into uh, various uh, kinds of uh, racist uh, uh, speech, uh, secretly recorded and then posted at Reddit, and uh, now the subject of wide discussion with President Biden having called for the resignation of uh, prominent Los Angeles Latino politicians. Um, I'm just wondering what what you make of that? I mean, that, that's that's more than just yelling out the N word at a basketball game. Yeah, I mean, there's so much in that. Episode. And, every, and excuse me, I just want to add: everybody involved is a quote person of color, close mm -hmm. quote. So it, it seems to reveal something about the intra minority group uh, political dynamic as it's uh, power uh, uh, competition playing out in Los Angeles uh, area politics. Mm hmm. You know, there, that was a rich episode. You could almost do a movie in that it was all very ordinary. I mean, how many of us of color have not heard or maybe even said that white kids aren't as well behaved, that that black and Latino people in particular kind of keep a rein on their kids? I will openly admit that I actually say it in my book, Losing the Race Way Back. I say it's very rare to see a black kid running up and down the aisles in a plane. And I said, it is. I'm not I'm sure it's happened, but I would say that there is a tendency in terms of that upbringing style. And I would be very open to somebody telling me I'm a racist for thinking so, but that's, that's ordinary. Calling a black kid a changuito, a little black monkey, that is... That is tough, but I'm sure that that is said among a great many Latino people of many levels of life when nobody is looking because there's a difference between neutral life and what's considered humor, what's considered group membership, you know, these sorts of, you know, stand-up routine sorts of things. And then it's funny just where we've come. The black kid in question is the adopted child of a white man they're talking about. And the white man talks about how upset he is in the news this week that they singled out this child who was just exhibiting black kid energy, black child energy. Well, what's black child energy? This is coming from somebody who's supposed to be the hero 
So black people have energy. Well, what does the white kid have? Intelligence? <laughs> that, even that one. Which means that we're expecting people to be perfect in a way that I'm not sure what the, the purpose of it is. So yes, those people had a conversation that you can practically hear people having on the subway, Soto Voce, Voce in New York every day. It's unfortunate, but you know, humanity is unfortunate in some ways. And the larger issue there is I can kind of understand that they want Latino power in the same way as Irish and Italians wanted Irish and Italian power a hundred years ago. It's tribalism. So it's there. It's unfortunate, but I wasn't surprised. There are conversations like that being had all over the country. I would love to hear some black council people talking, for example, here in New York City. <laughs> That's just the way humanity, unfortunately, is. And so, yeah, I am poo-pooing it. Um, I understand why when it's exposed, those people can no longer be in office. Yeah, if we're gonna if we're gonna be able to play it over and over again. But I'm not surprised that's just the way they talk behind closed doors. My question is, to what extent does it hurt anyone if they do, and black or Latino or white? And I'm not sure what the answer to that question is, but that's the question I would ask, not just whether they're impolite. And I, I thought it exposed in terms of the coalition of non-whites uh, fissures that are maybe a harbinger of things to come. I don't live in uh, greater L.A., but uh, my impression is that uh, the shift in relative influence of the Black versus the Latino, Hispanic um, uh, populations there is well, well advanced now, and uh, Blacks are on the short end of the stick uh, in that regard. Um, and, you know, the happy face uh, representation of uh, non-whites uh, all being on the same page is kind of exposed as a fallacy in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Everybody there is a Democrat, but a lot of uh, Hispanics, and we've been reading this in the commentary on the upcoming election, um, may not be voting Democratic in, in the same way that they have in the past. Uh, exposing the L.A. Uh, incident, uh, exposing... Uh, fissures in that regard, uh, those fissures perhaps being a harbinger of a deeper political uh, disunity uh, within that coalition, and uh, that could have electoral consequences. Uh, that was the sum yeah, the substance of my comment. It's a tough one, partly because amidst those comments was the one about, well, he's with the blacks, you know, the blacks. Yeah, you know, like exactly. That was Gascon. They were talking about the L.A. Uh, district attorney there, and uh, I, I don't remember exactly what the context of that evocation of him was, but the reaction was, uh, he's with the Blacks. Mm -hmm. and so you which know, means there are the Blacks, and then there are us, and he's right. with the Blacks. Right. There ain't no people of color happy talk down there in Los Angeles. It's, you no. know, you with us, or you with the Blacks. And, you know, one of the fissures is, among Latinos who talk like that, is that, quote-unquote, the Blacks have an idea that we're supposed to be exempt from the rules. And we get into what you often refer to more than I do as the riots in 2020 and the idea that that sort of thing is okay. That's a much less popular idea among Latino activists, that, this, that racism means that anything we do has to be understood within historical context. And so my sense, I don't know about Nuri Martinez, et cetera, but my sense is that the reason she might nod when somebody talks about the blacks is because of, I'm going to date myself, this kind of Maxine Waters-esque way of looking at these sorts of things, where she was dancing with gang members. I'll openly admit this is now 35 years ago. But that sort of thing. So no, you can't have that colorful coalition when you have that kind of fissure. And I'm suspecting that that's part of what would create someone saying something like that. Now, is it partly just pure tribalism and bigotry, a la Charles Blow? Sure, that's part of it. But I think part of it is also that we tend to tell Omar something different than they would tell Raphael. And I think that matters. Uh, flesh that out a little bit. What, what is it that uh, Raphael is hearing that Omar is not hearing? Omar is told that um, Omar is told that anything that he does has to be understood as part of the historical context of structural racism, and even outright bigotry in the way he's treated by the cops. And so it's not a riot, it's an insurrection. Or at least that's the way people discuss Omar. I'm not sure how much Omar's ear is cocked to listening to the message himself. But in terms of a Latino person who came up hard and hasn't had advantages, 
there's much less of a conversation saying we've got to understand what he did and pardon it because of the difficulties that Latino people have in this country. My experience with most Latinos is that even in on the grassroots level, there is, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but there's more of a sense that you make the best of things despite the racism. That's not to say that there are no black people who feel that way. But, you know, once you, in academia, I'd say it's about the same with black people and Latino people. But once you get out onto the street, there is a stronger sense among ordinary Latinos that you have to, you just have to play ball. You've got to play ball. That is my sense. Whereas there's a sense that black people have been given and I think has been given. It's something that trickles down and it's a process that I would love to investigate. I always say I'm going to and I don't. But I think the black street is encouraged to think you can only expect so much of us because of the nature of the past. And perhaps our past is especially different because our ancestors were brought here as slaves, although it gets to be that that was rather a long time ago. And Latinos suffered from what you might call Jim Crow almost as much as we did. But still, do you know what I mean? That there's the meme that we're not responsible for ourselves beyond a certain point, which say an immigrant culture is less likely to have. It's partly the immigrant difference. Well, that's what I was thinking. Uh, I was thinking that uh, Latinos are, are immigrants and uh, the entitlement, the sense of entitlement betrayed by telling your misbehaving kid that uh, you didn't do anything wrong, the system is, uh, is all against you, you know, or making excuses for the violent criminals that are preying in your neighborhood by saying it's racial capitalism that's at the root of the problem or whatever. That kind of rhetoric is less likely to be encountered in a population that is substantially an immigrant first or second generation population for, for obvious reasons. I, I, I was thinking that. Um, are being told, you know, riots. You say, you don't say riot as much as I do. Well, why not? I mean, riots are riots. I mean, <laughs> you know, there were protests and there were riots. It's very easy to make a distinction between those things. And uh, in the face of rioting, the admonition, go back to your house, you're breaking the law, we're at zero tolerance for your looting and your violence, uh, might have had a different impact on people's behavior, or maybe not, I don't know. Were politicians cowardly and uh, opinion leaders, journalists and so forth, cowardly for not more vigorously denouncing that behavior? Are they cowardly in the face of high crime rates now in inner city communities around the country for not more vociferously denouncing the despicable you, you know, behavior of these people, holding them accountable? Uh, is that a law and order is that uh, Willie Horton 2.0? You, you, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. But we were talking about hoaxes just a minute ago, and there, there are lots of different levels at which a hoax can be uh, uh, perpetrated. You can say they hung a noose out my, outside my dorm room when they maybe didn't, or they shouted uh, the N-word at me when they maybe didn't. Or you can allege that uh, a uh, political candidate campaigning against the high rates of crime is a racist because he's practicing Willie Horton uh, you know, co code word, uh, dog whistle politics, when in fact, all he's doing is standing up for law and order, which you should have been doing in the first place. Or you can say that when Georgia changes its election laws uh, and Stacey Abrams doesn't like it, it's Jim Crow 2.0. You can say that from the White House briefing room, when in fact, it's no such thing as Jim Crow 2.0 as court reviews of the legislation and the subsequent voting behavior the people subject to the legislation demonstrates. So hoax, they're, they're the small-scale hoaxes, and then there are the mega hoaxes. You know, it's, there's a thought experiment <clears throat> that's useful here. And thought experiments are not scientific study, but it's useful as a starting point. Michael Brown, Ferguson. Yeah. You've, you've been following even with one eye. What do we know about him now? The original story was a hoax told by his friend Dorian Abbott. And everything you hear about his life up until that point is that it's not that he was the devil incarnate, but this was not a model life, right down to the fact that he had committed theft in a store just minutes before the, the final incident happened. It was not a model life in any way. Yet there's a certain extent to which he's considered a hero by some people, as you can see in the film that Shelby Steele made, and as you can just see listening around. 
The facts are considered inconvenient. In su- to some extent, he's a hero. Remember him being called a gentle giant. And the thing is, from what we hear, that doesn't quite fit what he was, he was like. And yet there's a sense that we have to view him through a different lens because, roughly, because racism. Notice there's no Latino Michael Brown. A whole lot of Latino boys get shot down, killed by the police. No hero like that. No Latino community has elevated somebody with that kind of story as some sort of hero that somebody would make a a movie about. If the person was kind of a bad seed, wasn't doing too well, nobody, it seems to me that the Latino community will be much more, much less likely to say, let's talk about him as a kind of a, a Jesus, a kind of Jesus figure. That, that there's a disinclination there. That's something that happens in a certain kind of black community with a certain kind of black conversation. And it's, it's worrisome because the people who feel that way, they, they're benevolent at heart. But it's a problem. And I always say there's going to be a movie. Maybe there isn't going to be a movie, but I assume there's going to be a Ferguson movie where they get this, you know, this large, talented black actor to play Michael Brown. There'll be lots of press. And when they show the incident of his life ending, it's all going to be very ambiguous and there's going to be all this talk about how the truth will never be known. But it is known. That's the sort of thing that I mean. What that film is going to be like or or that opera as opposed to the way Latinos might handle it. And I'm stereotyping, I must admit, but I'm talking about tendencies. In your piece about the Duke uh, volleyball players claim and your, uh, your dubiousness in the face of it, You point out that uh, there's a tendency to echo back to the past. And in the past, we know these things really did happen. You know, Michael Brown is Emmett Till 2.0, this kind of Mm -hmm. thing. Exactly. Uh, And uh, I think if I were searching for an explanation for this difference between the, for the fact that there is no uh, Latino Michael Brown in our public imagination, uh, that's where I'd look. I'd look to historical narrative. I'd look to how it is that we understand the present moment in the context of all that has come before. And for African Americans, this kind of violent victimization and at the hands of law enforcement in the case at hand, but more generally, it, you know, lynching, um, you know, is a, a part of the past. I'm not saying that such events didn't happen to Latino victims as well. I'm sure they did, and I don't know as much about it perhaps as, I'm, as I could. But the memory of those events seems to burn more uh, hotly and, and more vividly in the imaginations, the contemporary imagination. So people are taking the next chapter uh, uh, in, in, in you know, making these claims. I mean, A congressman, I think this is Bobby Rush, correct me if I'm wrong, on the floor. This is in the wake of Trayvon Martin, the hoodie. uh, He Mm -hmm. just wanted a a Coke or whatever. He just wanted a drink and a candy, and he had a hoodie, and he ended up paying with his life. That was the story about Trayvon Martin. Well, you know, that, that was not exactly an accurate account, but a congressman in the well of the House of Representatives pulls a hood out from under his suit over his head, violating the dress code of the, of the chamber. But in order to invoke this continuity with, you see, we, we Black people were all embedded in this historical, ongoing, racist uh, machination. Um, and I, I, I think that that, you know, uh, uh, Jesse Smollett, you know, I mean, he's, it's a trope. It's, 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 a, it's a pulling something off the shelf that, you know, stimulates our memory of and, and our uh, fury at and, and our sense of resignation in the face of the implacable American racism. And uh, no, it doesn't seem to me, uh, an outsider, that that kind of sentiment has anything like the salience uh, amongst the Latinos, as does uh, this, uh, this trope and the, this... this uh, manipulation of historical narrative on behalf of present day political objective uh, as it has in the life of political life of black Americans. I think um, an anthropologist looking at our times, something we're so used to, we barely think of it as a thing, is an anthropologist would be perplexed 
to see the degree to which victimization is exaggerated. It's a major trope. Victimization is one thing. And so, you know, you, you see that in the past in particular and sometimes now. But the idea that there's an enlightenment in exaggerating and making things up, that's weird. I wonder about whether that's happened anywhere else in human civilization. It's a very modern condition. And it's a problem because I don't think it creates anything good. I think there's some people who think that that kind of exaggeration is somehow an advance, that it's a way of changing thought to push the envelope somewhat. I've never heard anybody admit it, but you get the feeling that's what's going on deep down. But I'm not sure what kind of change it advances. It just creates a general kind of skepticism, which most people aren't going to voice in public. They're not going to write a column about it. But when somebody says, you know, somebody was shouting nasty wor racialized words at me from the stands and it became this raucous outcry and I could barely get through the game. And it turns out that the audience was really just sitting there the way any other, you know, audience at a volleyball game at Brigham Young University. You know, how raucous was it going to get? It turns out that that isn't true. That's not good for the American polity, nor is it good for the evidence to come in that it wasn't true and for the good thinking venues to not say anything. I don't see what that builds. That's not right. Because if a racist does anything, then we have to hear about that for the next six months down to every nitty gritty detail. But we don't want to hear about the stories that turn out not to be true. Although, as I say in, in the piece, Wilfred Riley has a whole book, Hate Crime Hoax, outlining hundreds of cases like this. Attention must be paid. It's a problem in our modern society, exaggerating your victimhood rather than being honest about it. Yeah, Will Riley, he's a political scientist, teaches at a black uh, Kentucky, Kentucky yes. State University. He's African-American. Kentucky State is a historically black institution. He's from Chicago. And he does have this book, which, which we should link to. Um, and he, he tries to be systematic about it. He tries to be quasi-scientific about trying to examine the universe of claims and assess the extent to which the, so, so many of them have proven to be uh, empty claims. Nooses outside of dorm rooms, you know, supposed racist treatment, et cetera. So, and everybody has to realize we're not talking about one thing every five years. This happens a lot. It's at the point I where you're skeptical as, as you hear about any colorful case. It happens a lot. And what's a lot? Well, it happens to an extent which if we were talking about cop killings, we would consider a complete epidemic. That's a lot. 400 during the 2000 teens is a lot. Cop killings, 400 during the 2000 teens? Is that what you said? 400 hoaxes, undeniable oh. hoaxes. Oh, okay, okay. That's a lot, you know. Uh, so <laughs> we should be giving voice to the other side and neither one of us is inclined to do so. There is another side. I, I just want to say this, John, my daughter, Tamara, mm -hmm. Elaine Chrysler, uh, who has uh, just uh, stepped away from her position as chief diversity officer for the Democratic National Committee mm -hmm. in order to take up similar responsibilities with uh, NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Action League, my daughter, mm -hmm. a Democrat and a lawyer and a lifelong advocate for diversity, equity and inclusion and an enemy of racism wherever it raises its ugly head, has petitioned mm -hmm. to come on The Glenn Show and to talk with me, you and me, if you're willing, uh, about the other side. And I'm inclined to say yes. I'm uh, inclined to do it too. I think it would be wonderful to talk to your daughter and to get feedback from somebody who doesn't think like us. We're often told we need to do that more. I right. think people are not in a position to understand that the people who do this are not going to be Nicole Hannah-Jones, Ibram Kendi, and ta Coates. They're not coming. But we need somebody who perhaps thinks a lot more like them than we do. I would yes. say we should have three issues. I would leave one to you, and then the other two, I'm sure you would join me, cops and affirmative action. Those, those three things, maybe. And just kind of divide it into those three so we don't end up going down a rabbit hole of just, you know, disputing, you know, what's racism, what's societal racism. But really, well, you know. Well, CRT would be the one I'd add to that. Okay, yeah, CRT. Cops, what is CRT, it? CRT, education issues more generally, and affirmative action admissions. And, you know, so let's, can, let's have that. I think that'd be a yeah. great, that'd be a great idea. 
um, okay, so maybe sometime before Thanksgiving gets around, we'll be able to arrange a, a joint conversation with her. <clears throat> Speaking of affirmative action, John, uh, a column a few weeks ago from you uh, just takes the gloves off, man. You say, stop messing with these Asian kids' future. Is, did I read you correctly? Did, did I not hear you say the Asians are being treated unfairly by this regime and it's outrageous. It reminds me of what they tried to do to the Jews back in the 20s and 30s and it wasn't good then and it ain't good now. Did I read you correctly, John? Yeah. Um, it's at the point where Asian kids are being discriminated against in top university admissions in order to make room for brown students. And I think that all of that is one of many signs that the idea that you give preference based on somebody's skin color, it's not that it didn't make sense 40 and 50 years ago, but it doesn't now. And I was very direct in that column. We need to stop this. We need to stop discriminating against Asians in that way and imagine how it would feel to be an Asian parent or an Asian student knowing that you have to be so much better to get in than certain other kids in the school. I also said as a codicil, I don't like legacy preferences either. I did a whole column about that. That is not the answer to what I'm saying. But I said it should be about disadvantage. If you've had disadvantages, you should get preferences in admissions. But that means no more for middle class and affluent black kids. No more. That's it. And to the extent that the number of kids um, who are black and middle, middle class and affluent would fall, because th th that would shrink the black population. It wouldn't shrink it to anything like nothing. And in the meantime, the kids that would have gone to, for example, Harvard, will get excellent educations at excellent other schools. It's not Yale or jail. And I said, the people who work at those excellent other schools would be very surprised that for a student to be admitted to that school is to deprive them of real opportunity, which is the way it's often talked about. If you work at the University of California, San Diego, you don't think of your school as somewhere where kids are consigned to not having opportunity and not making connections. That's not what administrators and professors there think, and they shouldn't. And so it's time. It's time to let it go. And only under those conditions will the numbers of black kids admitted to schools like that go up, because the only way to get into them will be to do what everybody else did. Why would, why would any but a very few of us do what everybody else did if the whole regime, as we've discussed, tells us that we don't have to. And just imagine being an Asian parent under this regime where Asians are being discussed the way Jews were being discussed 100 years ago in admissions in order to keep their numbers down. It's not right. And it's not something where you shake your head and look over somebody's shoulder and say it's complicated. It's time to stop this. It's time to let it go. And so what the Supreme Court is about to do, I hate the Supreme Court right now, but what they're about to do, you know, uh, you know, a clock is, you know, because of clock abortion, is excuse, me, excuse me for interrupting, John, you just said something provocative. You hate the Supreme Court. Is it because of the Dodds decision or mm -hmm. what? Or because All there are it. too many Catholics on the Supreme Court? Would you go that no, far? Too, I mean, the Supreme Court is being Republican. They're not being judges. They're being Republicans. Okay. I don't like it. But we got to talk there. about that because because I I, yeah. I I disagree. But that but th that's a long conversation. Let, let's let's. Uh, mm -hmm. <sighs> So affirmative action. So how the Asian students are being treated. There's also how the black students are being treated. And I think you could make an argument that it's not in their interest either in the very longest of long runs. They're being patronized. I think you could argue. They're being set up for failure. I think you could argue. Um, they're, they're, they're being put in a situation where because they had less uh, outstanding qualifications coming in, they generate less outstanding performance after admission. That's a necessity given that the criteria used to assess fitness for selection are correlated with the performance of students after the fact of test scores and grades and so on. And then that has to be covered up. So there's a kind of underhandedness and dishonesty in the whole anti-meritocratic uh, aspect to the whole thing. So I, I, I think you could say all of that, but somebody's gonna say that's not what the Supreme Court is being asked to decide in these cases, not whether or not the policy of affirmative action is a good or a bad idea. The Supreme Court is being asked to decide whether or not the practice of affirmative action violates the Constitution or is consistent with the statutes. Um, and uh, if they are to overturn previous precedents 
that authorized the use of limited use of race in uh, selection, they'd be doing something not dissimilar to what they did when they overturned uh, the Roe versus Wade case. They would be rewriting the law after it had been settled as a principle and established within American political custom differently now than they do. They'd be overturning earlier decisions. That's a radical thing for them to do. You don't like the Supreme Court being radical in a conservative direction when it's uh, dealing with abortion. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's what I hear you saying. But you do like them being radicals when they uh, overturn affirmative action. I think one of your colleagues at the New York Times is going to write a column implicitly criticizing you in exactly, I'm not going to name him, in, in exactly those terms. Are you a hypocrite? <laughs> no, no, it's, um, it's messy because I firmly believe that in the case of the racial preferences decisions, they were unnecessarily partisan and I'm not sad to see them reversed. I felt that way 20 years ago. But, of course, that's very subjective. What's going on here is not pretty. Social history and legislative history is often messy. But if the result here is to knock off this phoniness and condescension and discrimination, then I can't say that I'm going to think it's been a bad thing. Okay, it didn't happen exactly the way I would have wanted it to, but frankly, the decisions that were made about affirmative action back in 2003, I thought were every bit as partisan and biased and fake as many people will consider the decision that we're about to see this fall to be. This stuff is messy, but I think that justice will have been done. I really think that. That makes me a hypocrite. I guess I am, but I'll be very happy to see a first generation of me's who are not treated as if we were Emmett Till. Enough. All black people are not the same anymore. Not enough of us are poor anymore for that policy to make sense. It's enough. Absent affirmative action, the numbers selected into the most exclusive academic venues, the Harvards and Stanfords and UC Berkeley's and UC North Carolina's of the world, University of North Carolina's of the world, uh, those numbers would drop. Uh, how much it's not clear, 10, 12 percent down to four or five percent is not an unreasonable guesstimate. Oh, right, yeah. Um, as you say, people would not be going to jail instead of Yale. They'd be going, I don't know, to the University of Illinois instead of Yale or to whatever, less, somewhat less selective places. But they'd still be getting college educations. So I think that much is clear. Um, but it would be a sea change. Uh, and it would, I think, foster a political firestorm. And it would be interpreted in the context of uh, the rolling back of rights, just as the abortion decision has been interpreted in the context of rolling back of rights. Um, and uh, it'll be political fodder uh, for the Democrats and for the Republicans. And unlike the abortion issue, which well may weigh in uh, the favor of Democrats in this midterm election coming up in a few weeks, this one, I think, will cut against the Democrats. I think it's an albatross for them. I think the position that you articulated is actually the winning position politically. Um, but we'll see. I'm ready, I'm ready for that fight because I really do believe that when you put these things properly before most black people in this country of any socioeconomic level, they get this. It's just that we talk about it with such buzzwords that it's easy to forget what we're talking about. You know, affirmative action is like saying blueberry muffins. Racial preferences is like saying rainbows and unicorns. But if you really talk about what this is, most people get it. And that's become more the case over the past 20, 25 years. So, yeah, I'm I'm ready. All right. John has declared his voice to be in need of rest. So we're going to allow him to rest his voice. Talk to you soon, John. We have the Q&A coming up. Uh, I'll be in touch. Definitely, Glenn. Talk to you very, very soon. All right.